Welcome to Conscious TV. My name is Renate McNeil, and my guest today is Tony Samara. Hello, Tony. Hello. I have books here from Tony. One is called Deeper Than Words, um, From the Heart, and Shaman's Wisdom. And they are all wonderful books. And I really enjoyed reading them. Tony is a shaman, a healer, and a spiritual teacher. And he was here with us before on Conscious TV. And um, we covered then his spiritual journey. Today we talk more about other experiences he had, about life, and about his work. So Tony, I like to start with um, your initiation into shamanism. Yes. Um, which I found fascinating when I read that. Uh, because you had to go, and I think every shaman in his initiation had to, has to go through, uh, through death, through dying and being reborn. And I would like to know how was this experience? And uh, I think you had to take, well, you tell <laughs> us. <laughs> okay. Well, to start with, you know, shamanism is such a um, wide perspective of different teachings. Mm -hmm. um, so it's quite specific. The way I worked was quite specific to South America, where I spent a lot of time. Um, but shamanism in general is healing. So it, yeah. it's the knowledge of how to do this, firstly, with aspects of yourself and um, your immediate community, yeah. and then how to apply that knowledge in a wider perspective. So I worked with South American shamans. I uh, think you were in northern Peru. Yeah, northern yeah. Peru and mm -hmm. uh, on the border to Brazil. Yeah. And I worked in that specific culture, which is wonderful because it's a mixture of native South American culture with the influence of the West, because of course South America has been colonized mm -hmm. um, for hundreds of years now. So the European perspective of the world is also present in the native culture. So basically, um, I didn't know anything because I'm not from South America, mm -hmm. um, but I had a strong connection to the people and nature, you know, to the forest, to the Amazon forest. Yeah. And just the feeling of the place uh, spoke deeply to my heart. So, you know, I went there not to study shamanism or to do anything specific. I went there as a marine biologist to work to help save the environment, okay. basically. Yes, yes. <laughs> so that was my... So you, ha you have a fascination with nature. Totally. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And that was my, you know, initial reason for being there. Yeah. After a while, I understood that, um, as everyone understands, that, you know, whatever your passion is, it's also your path. So, yeah. and you have to go deeper. It's not enough just to save the world. You have to also look at what is creating the disharmony in the world within yourself. So that is yeah, what a death... Yeah, you have to save yourself Exactly, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh -huh. And that is what a death rebirth experience is. The death mm -hmm. is basically the death of what the ego or the mind believes to be important. Mm -hmm. And the rebirth is being born again into the wider perspective of reality, you know, yeah. what it is to be a human being, but not focused on yourself, but focused as part of nature, as part of the wholeness that is nature. Yeah. And that was my experience. In a personal sense, it was very painful because I think every human being likes to hold on to little pictures about themselves and mm -hmm. what they believe to be true and what they feel and what they think. And to let go of all those things sounds easy. But so what, what forced you to let go? Well, there was no, there was no choice, really. <laughs> <laughs> because when you live with real people, yeah. um, you have to be real. And native people, you know, they, they live in a very simple, um, quite um, real environment. And they have to be themselves. They can't yeah. be something else because that's a way to survive in the rainforest. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I realized that I needed to communicate my depth to the people yeah. and not just, I'm here to save the rainforest or I'm here to help you. You know, I had to see the deeper perspective of why am I 
here in the middle of the rainforest. It's not even the place I was born or grew up in. Uh, what, what brought me here? And I understood and also it, it was explained to me that I'm there in the rainforest. I feel like I'm there today yeah. um, to help um, come to some sort of understanding about myself mm -hmm. rather than try to save the people. And the understanding was, you know, how can I bring that native knowledge that I could see and I could feel yeah. into the perspective of the Western world. So yeah. I had to experience that within myself, you know, to let go of the social ideas and to the projections that I had and yeah. to the belief systems and the addictions to fear, you know, that is one big thing that Western people, yeah. you know, don't understand. But we, we live in a very fear-based culture you know, where we are conflicting with the laws of nature all the time to support the idea of who we are within that little context of the Western culture. And I believe that we are much more. Yeah, and I needed to see that. So you had to let go of your survival fear. Survival fear and the fear of opening up and being intimate with nature and yeah. being close to the forces of nature without, you know, hiding behind yeah. a mask yeah. and, and you know people when they go into a rainforest where there is all sorts of creatures and dangers real dangers you know and it, there's no silence and you there write is no silence book. it's so noisy <laughs> <laughs> musically you, you noisy cannot, you cannot <laughs> escape the noise exactly yeah. i mean yeah. every animal is singing mm -hmm. a song every insect is yeah. you know alive with energy and even the feeling of nature is alive with such ecstatic energy it, it's difficult to hide behind your mind pictures yeah. you know to to be partaking in what's going on yeah. you need to be real you need to be open and in the beginning that was very difficult for me because i love nature and i studied nature mm -hmm. but i was not able to approach it in the way that native people showed to be so easy and so beautiful to me, you know, how they walked, how they related to yeah. everything around them. I just couldn't do that within myself in a real sense. Mm -hmm. I could pretend that I was, you know, whoever in harmony with nature, but the reality was I was looking out, you know, is there a snake, is there scorpions, is there sure. this, is there that, yes. you know, yeah. because, um, you know, that's what the mind does. It's yeah. afraid of anything that it doesn't understand or can't control and you can't control nature <laughs> <laughs> it, I saw a few years ago a movie I don't know if you saw it it was called Emerald Forest and it was about a family uh, an American family they moved or but, but he was transferred to uh, Brazil to the rainforest mm. to build uh, I think it's called dam uh -huh, in yeah, the water the dam. dam. And they had a little boy. And the the tribes in, in the in the rainforest were observing what they were doing. Uh -huh. And they felt so sorry for this little boy. So uh -huh. they kidnapped him. Uh -huh, wow. Because they thought he needs to grow up in nature. <laughs> so they kidnapped him and um, he grew up in nature and there was this scene where the boy was about 12 year, years old mm -hmm. and he had to go through an initiation. Mm -hmm. And he had to dive down into, into a, a, a pool of, into a, in, in a pond and get something and do all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And what was so touching for me was the mother, I mean, the ad adopted mother, mm -hmm. stood there and said to him, I will never see my little boy again. Mm -hmm. Which meant, you are not allowed to come back as a boy. You are only allowed to come back into this tribe mm -hmm. as oh. a grown-up. Yes. And I think we, we are missing something like that in our culture. Totally, totally. Yeah. I, I believe that we act as children, you yes. know, not spoiled children, mm -hmm. towards nature and towards um, just the beauty of living. And I think yeah. that's what tribal people have that they haven't lost. And that is what we can learn from how to 
look at rituals and initiations in a way where they are useful and sacred and create a possibility for us to move beyond certain limitations into a new perspective. And that is what initiation is. And yeah. as you say, you know, we can grow into being fully part of the community, whichever community we live in, mm -hmm. and, and be productive and useful and part of that joy. Yeah rather than, you know, always wanting to take everything away from nature so that we support our selfish needs. Mm. That, that sounds like a very interesting film. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> really? If yeah. you haven't seen it, yes, you, you probably would like <laughs> it. So, um, you have such a passion, I mean, comes across in your book for, for true nature, you know, in its in the aspect of life and Mother Earth and also the spiritual rhymes. Mm -hmm. And uh, how, can you just tell us, I don't remember now if, how much you said in the first interview, how you come to realize through nature, what, what woke you up? Yes, um, I think nature is something that we you know, all love and feel at home and relate to in a way that is universal. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a beautiful thing because it takes us beyond our differences. You know, when anyone looks at a sunset or looks at the beautiful ocean or mountains, you mm -hmm. know, we feel a connection to the world that is very difficult to, you know, say I'm this or I'm that. It's, it's just universal. So I feel that is something that children love, you know, mm -hmm. they love nature and it's a pity in the Western world that we are so far removed from the natural laws of nature and how to do things in harmony with nature. So for me, uh, my teaching is to bring that important realm into spirituality because it is part of spirituality, you know, when, mm -hmm. when you let go of the way the mind controls perspectives and the way the mind likes to see things, then we become more natural. We become ourselves. And when we become more natural, we are much more able to understand how nature is a teacher. You know, every aspect of nature brings some sort of quality that can be part of who you are. And this is, for me, you know, a very, very important part of the teaching, and especially in children. Um, I think you had a grandmother who was teaching you exactly. nature, wasn't it? Exactly. <laughs> I had the same <laughs> grandmother. <laughs> exactly, and that yeah. was, this is the reason why I have the love for nature, because mm -hmm. from a very early age I was shown, in, in a real sense, the value of nature and how to go back to nature when things were disharmonious within me. So this is always what I did, you know, if there was a conflict in the family or if there was something that created disharmony around me, I would always go to nature, uh, sit under a tree or I'd just lie in the garden or do something where, you know, that harmony in nature created a more um, balanced perspective about the whole thing yeah. for me, just being present to nature. And my grandmother was definitely, you know, the main influence mm. to mm. allow me to understand that not only do you have to relax in nature and come back to harmony um, with yourself in nature, but also that you can be active in utilizing the natural forces in nature to heal and to change yeah. um, aspects that we believe that we can only do by ourselves. And this is what I was um, taught in the Amazon forest. I was taught how to use natural remedies to cleanse the body and how to let go of certain blocks in, in the body. For example, fear that somehow um, pollutes the liver or perhaps, you know, toxins that hold you so tightly together that you, you feel that you, you're caged in through the toxins of pain or suffering or whatever it is. Yeah. And, and that there are natural remedies that you can use that help to release this physical remedies, but also energetic remedies. And we know this, you know, if, if you're feeling stressed, all you have to do is walk somewhere where there is more oxygen or ions in the air and your whole brain has the possibility to relax and be more focused and more productive. So nature is very useful on many levels. 
I remember often visiting my grandmother and she would had, have on every shelf, she would have these paper sheets with all these different herbs and she would talk to them. And then later she had on her table, um, yeah, and then use them and make tea and yes. concussions and all kinds of things. And later she had this, this, uh, this, the kitchen table and there were some plants on it. And then she had to take pills for her heart. She was very old. And then she would take a pill and then she would give the plant the same pill. Wow. And she would say, what's good for me is also good for the plant. <laughs> <laughs> <And> the, <laughs> the love, the attention, I guess. <laughs> um, didn't worry I so much <laughs> about the toxins <laughs> of, the, of the pill. But I it was very sweet. I understand. Um, and I know you can talk to the plants to you. you. I mean, it's called Icarus. You can sing the song. Yes. Of the Mother Earth, or you hear yes. Yes. the I, song of I, So I understand your grandmother because I believe yeah. everything has a signature which is, in essence, a movement of energy, which is sound in the yeah. end. Um, and you can replicate every aspect of nature through creating a sound, such as, for example, in India, they have the sound of Om which I yeah. believe to be yeah. um, the beginning of creation or the manifestation of creation. Every aspect of nature has that power. So you can utilize those signatures to connect to the essence of plants or the essence of a mountain mm -hmm. or the stars, and you can bring that quality into healing. So if you are sick, for example, with say, heart disease, like yeah. you were saying with yeah. your grandmother, yeah. um, you can connect to that signature that allows the heart to find the power of healing through the plants or through aspects of nature. And I, I think this is even used in homeopathy where, you know, somehow yeah. the vibration of certain That's right, that is plants. homeopathy. E exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. it's easy, you know, it's not but, difficult. But then, Tony, I mean, there are certain illnesses which start in the mind. So, and in my own experience, and I worked for many years as a healer, um, unless something shifted in the mind, you can heal the body in the moment, but it's coming out somewhere else, or it's coming back at the same place. So something is a, is, is a, is the the herb or the plant able to shift the very thing in the mind? Well, or what do you do yeah. <laughs> to help people wake up? Because I know yes. your message is you travel around in the world and your passion is to wake people up, yes. up to who they are. Exactly. To know that everything is one. Yes. Yeah. That, that's a very important question because yeah. it takes us beyond the mundaneness of, you know, I'm sick and I want to get better. Yes. Why are you yeah. sick? Do you know, yeah. what is causing the disharmony? Yeah. And most people don't want to know why, they just want to get better and carry on sure. doing whatever they yeah. are doing that created perhaps the illness in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> so I would say that if someone is ready to go to that depth and change their life, transform their life, of course there are natural remedies out there that can help. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, for example, the Native Americans have used herbs such as sage, which is considered very sacred. Yeah. In, in India, also, there are herbs that people don't know really what they are. The soma, for yeah. example, that yeah. is written in the Vedas, mm -hmm. um, you know, that are sacred, that I believe help to transform consciousness, which is the core of my work, really, in yes. the end. Yes. How to change the mind that's created that picture of disharmony that in the end has influenced the physical body to create disease. Because yes. everything begins in the mind. Sure. That, you know, every thought yeah. that you have yeah. creates some sort of disharmony, which has to go somewhere. And of course it goes to the physical body or to the way you feel or to yeah. the way you relate to yourself mentally. And um, so I believe that meditation in essence is the way forward. And that is how to understand the mind 
and how to understand to let go of those perspectives that are creating disharmony. And actually, it's quite a joyous thing, you know, when you let go of things that make you unhappy, you know, because <laughs> uh, you know, they're, they're not useful. <laughs> that is meditation. Um, yeah. But there are plants that help meditation. That, that is meditation. Exactly, me for me. That is meditation, to let go of everything that veils your joy and your spontaneous presence to this moment. So you're not talking about sitting down in meditation? <laughs> Well, you can, you can <laughs> sit down in meditation if that's more comfortable. <laughs> but well, it, tell, tell me more, it's interesting, because you also say something. To change a habit, we have to meditate for 120 days. That changes the whole phys physiology of the body. Yes. So tell me more about that. Okay, so, I mean, the, the thing with Western perspectives is that we want things to happen immediately. Yeah. We, we, you know, we want to sit and meditate for 20 minutes and then if it doesn't work we say, okay, you know, meditation, I stop, it, meditating. I stop meditating and yes. it doesn't really work for me. Yeah. But habits, as we know, you know, take a long time to change. Anyone who's been addicted to cigarettes or alcohol or any... Or suffering. Or suffering, exactly, yeah. to their own mental picture, yeah. knows that you have to be quite disciplined on some level and practice that clarity for a little while so that everything is let go of, so that you let go of not just the mental picture but also the physical structure that holds on to that mental picture. Mm -hmm. For example, if we have fear, you know, it's not just an idea. Fear lives in the body, lives in your emotions, lives in the nervous system. Yeah. And how do you let go of that without continuously reminding yourself of what is real? And meditation, you know, some people are lucky. Some people will meditate for 20 minutes and have an enlightening experience and yeah. be free. But, you know, that's not very common. Um, that's what <laughs> they think. Some people just have an experience to be free, but then it's creeping all back again. Exactly, especially yeah. if it's still And lives. then what happens often, the ego takes hold of the experience. And sees it as very important yeah. and then yeah. focuses on that rather than you know, expressing that beauty in the body, in the way you relate to nature, in the way you relate to people mm -hmm. and yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and this is why I think any habit requires a long time to, to transform. And that is a joy. So actually when you are practicing meditation with that intention to let go of something, you, you're not counting the days, you're not thinking, okay, I've got 80 more days to go. You understand that yeah. you're getting closer and closer, so your heart feels more um, joy, more celebration, that you're getting closer to something that is so beautiful that, you know, it becomes timeless. Your journey becomes, you know, a whole movement of meditation. And then in the end, after 120 days, you know, you don't realize that... So how... how how does that look practically, Tony? Oh, okay. uh, let's say, let's take a habit, yeah? Yes. Um, a, a visible habit, you know, there's so many habits which are running through us which are not visible. Exactly. Um, so let's take like, like an addiction to suffering or an addiction or, or whatever, fear. Fear is a great one. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So how do you, how do you resolve that on a practical level. Okay, so the first step would be to understand that you have fear, to, mm -hmm. to, to be conscious, okay, you know, I have whatever uh, personality situations that create who I am, um, but I also have something that I don't really like inside of me and that is fear, Yeah. which usually <coughs> it becomes unconscious or, you know, subconscious. It, it, it's hidden behind what is obvious. When we focus on that, it comes up to the surface, you know, it shows itself. And one thing which is very common is that we say, oh, we don't want that. So we try to find other things, enlightenment or freedom or whatever idea yeah. that people have that moves us away from the, the nasty the feelings. Experience, yeah, yeah, the experience. Mm -hmm. So I would say when you open up and say, okay, I want to embrace fear from that perspective of freedom. I don't want to run away from it then you are becoming more conscious. That is the first step to meditation, consciousness. And, you know, when you are conscious that you have to work with fear, you're also conscious of the aspects of fear 
that need to be let go of. So, for example, if you're afraid of expressing your love to someone, mm -hmm. which, you know, obviously is very much part of fear, you know, okay, I'm not going to fall into the old habit of playing a game or projecting or hiding behind a mask. I can show my love more clearly because I can see what fear is and I can see how it controls me. And I don't want to be controlled by that subconscious force anymore. I want to be real. I want to be myself. When you do that, nature, this is why nature is important for me, and also the universal aspect of nature, the stars, the galaxies, are naturally aligned to be more real. And when you are getting more into that space of realness, then nature supports your journey and you feel that you're not alone and the movement from the unconscious primitive mind of survival transcends itself and becomes much more I don't know really what the word is but much more enlightened you know mm -hmm. this is the word that people use um, <laughs> people, use, <laughs> people you use, don't use it <laughs> I don't like it because it creates that sense of you know enlightened not enlightened but you know more free to yeah. explore itself in, in a real sense and, and show love and then you can begin to be more like a spontaneous child you know and mm -hmm. show who you are to the mm -hmm. person and usually we realize that what we're afraid of are aspects of ourselves not the love that we we think will hurt us or whatever reasons we had to justify that fear yeah. and you know when we see when we begin to see things as they really are, that love is actually a beautiful feeling and the more we show to the world, the mo more we show to our partner um, or children, the more that reflects back not just from the family or from your partner but also from the universe. There is a synchronicity that happens which supports your journey. Everything becomes more beautiful, more real. And This is what I found to be in South America. People are so real that in those dangerous, very difficult places, and uh, the Amazon forest is not, you know, paradise as people think. You know, it, it, it's it's real. You know, it has many aspects to it. There is a support that only happens to native people because they are they have let go of those fears, um, and I feel that in our Western culture today, we have to let go of those fears to transform that culture of aggression, the culture of war, the culture where we are constantly looking at what is important and best for us and ignoring, you know, the common good um, and, and the beauty that can be shared with everyone in this world. This is why we're here. Yeah. Uh, well, it brings up a question in me of what freedom is. Because would you consider the people in South America free? I mean, they probably have other limitations. Yes. yes. What is freedom for you? How do you experience freedom? That's you know, a good freedom question, is yeah. is not only being able to deal with snakes or sounds <laughs> or whatever. Freedom is exactly. so much, much more. It is. It is. So I, I think, you know, in the end, I don't try to put my perspective um, onto people's, you know, belief systems or religious. Um, ideals. Yeah. I, I think freedom in the end is something that you know from your heart. Kabir and Rumi, the famous poets, speak yeah. about this. When your heart is able to just celebrate being alive and seeing the value in everything in that moment of aliveness. Now different people will, you know, measure that sense of freedom according to where they are at. You know, for some people Freedom may mean, you know, just to be free of disease because that is physical yeah. disease. You yeah. have cancer and you know, yeah. that's what you want to be free of. Yeah. Maybe when you're free of the disease, you realize, wow, that was a journey. Maybe I want to be free of the suffering that my mind is creating. But not everyone understands that perspective until they go through certain experiences yeah. in life. And this is why we're here on Earth, you know, to, yeah. to develop and to change our perspective. And I feel Today, more than ever, more and more people are ready to transform the core, the essence, which is the maya, I call it the maya, meaning the illusion yeah. that the mind creates. And I think freedom then is obvious, you know, it's like Buddha 
um, experience, you know, if, if you're attached to the negative perspectives of the mind, fear, worry, stress, then you're not free. And if you let all those aspects go, then there is a freedom that can't be spoken about, because if, as soon as you start speaking about that freedom, you're placing some perspective onto that freedom that limits the freedom because it's a human perspective. Mm -hmm. And this is why, for example, in Sufism and in the mystical traditions of the Middle East, people don't like to put names to the divine. You know, yeah. they, they reflect aspects of the divine um, as important, but they don't actually say the divine is this, and that is the ultimate. Because in the end, when you are in the space of freedom, then you don't need to you know, say, I'm here, look, you know, this is where I'm at, because, you know, then you are at, in the middle of something that is so beyond understanding, you can only express it in your attributes, like Mother Teresa or Gandhi, where your actions speak louder than your words. And for me, you know, freedom goes beyond words. This is why I wrote the book you know, beyond yes. words, because you know? yes. <laughs> there is no word to explain yeah, true freedom. In, in a way, <laughs> <clears throat> True freedom is um, when, you know, the self is not there anymore, not dominant, exactly. you know, with its noise and, and uh, but you know, here we go in the moment through a phase um, in the West of, we are all hit by this enlightenment bug and <laughs> everybody is on this journey towards somewhere, uh, somewhere <laughs> <laughs> where they feel more happier. <laughs> and blissful and um, just talking to you and reading your books um, is um, made me actually realize to a much greater depth we have to take nature with us into the picture yes. which hardly any ever you know I had so many interviews but not many people talk about that aspect. Yes, yeah. yes. And um, so that's one thing, um, the beauty, how you bring those two together and, yes. and your teaching in that. But then the question which arises is, isn't what we see a reflection of our mind? Of course. So then, we are not focusing on saving the planet. Of course. <laughs> this is what I realized. <laughs> this is what I realized. I had such an idea, I need to save the rainforest. But actually, you, you're saving the rail, rainforest or saving whatever the planet, saving whatever your passion is by being. Yeah. Uh, and that is the mystery of the alchemical process, you know. It's not out there. You don't need anything specific that um, you, you have to do. I mean, you, you do um, need to do things. I'm not saying, you know, you just sit down and do nothing. But it, it, has, it must come from a different perspective of, I need to go to that place and do this to save the rainforest. So I realized that my journey to many places, not just the rainforest, to the Zen Buddhist monastery and to the many parts of India and around the world where I met wise people, in the end was just an invitation to reflect back in this moment the reality that I was needing to understand. Um, so, you know, your question is how, you know, to change that perspective. You know, if you mm -hmm. want to save the rainforest, how can you do it from the, the perspective of freedom? Yes. I think, you know, that is impossible to answer because when you are free, yeah. everything that you do then channels that universal, beautiful love that is nature. And you become so powerful, you know, not from an ego sense, but you become so powerful in your actions that you influence much more than is possible um, from the perspective where you want to conflict with certain situations so that you can change mm -hmm. what is happening around you. So this is why Mother Teresa, for example, you know, she all she did was some very simple, beautiful actions with people. It, she didn't sit back and do nothing. She, her karma yoga, so to speak, or her yeah. selfless service was real. Yeah. But it came from a perspective that is so much more powerful it's a free perspective. 
you know, and I, I believe yeah, that. She was, a, she was basically, you become a tool. Exactly, of, exactly. Of the universe, or exactly. of true nature, or the absolute. Exactly. To, to channel itself. Yeah, and to channel that yeah. beauty and love, which then allows for miracles to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think we need a miracle in this world today that, you know, where we're facing so many interesting challenges. Yeah. And the miracle doesn't have to come from one person or one perspective. I think it's a group consciousness where, as humanity, we realize that together from that perspective where we are able to channel love, where we are able to channel what is in essence so beautiful and so good, everything changes. We, we just, we, we create a quantum leap into a perspective that we can't even see from where we're at in this moment. Sure. And this happens, you know, to everyone. You know, you can imagine, you know, when you're a teenager and you see the world in one way and, you know, everything is so intense and powerful and you see things in that teenage way, which is beautiful. And then look at how life changes, you know, as you have experiences and you adapt and change to whatever life is teaching you. See, everything changes, everything is impermanent. And in the end, we have that experience, but in people want to hold on to one perspective. And if we are just free enough to let go of the old and, and invite the new, and the new is, you know, that perspective of yeah. freedom. Then but as you, as you mentioned earlier, <coughs> how difficult it is, it is to change a habit. It is. And in particular, this whole survival, every, I mean, so many people out there in the moment, because of the situation, running on their survival, um, fear of survival. Yes. How can you tell them to let go? How can you tell them? <laughs> Whatever you tell, how do you do that? What do you teach, Tony? Yeah. How do you wake people up? I tell them, come and experience meditation. You know, because the first step is consciousness. Mm -hmm. Come and sit in a space where the chaotic mind and the chaotic situation that you're seeing on TV or reading on the news just takes a back seat somewhere or just you let it go for a little while yeah. and observe what it's like to sink into a different reality. You know, you cannot explain, you cannot force people to see this. You can only allow that experience to happen. So this is why, for me, meditation is so essential. It's so simple, you know, it is simply um, a technique of focus, where you focus on something that allows the mind not to drift off here and there and everywhere into all the worries, stresses, addictions, that you know, the mind likes to go to, to control it and to stop it. And just see that there is something beyond that struggle that can allow for freedom. Now, I can't put that in words. That's mm -hmm. why it's an experience. Mm -hmm. This is why I say you need to sit and meditate for 120 days. You know, it's not enough for 20 minutes one day to experiment to see if it works or not. Because the deeper you go, it's like a dream. Mm -hmm. You know, the deeper you go into the dream, the more sense it makes. And when you sit and meditate, you find quietness, you find stillness inside of yourself. And behind that stillness, in that stillness, there are some perspectives that you can explore. And, you know, for, for some people, they're lucky. You know, it happens immediately. They just say, wow, I understand. For other people, it takes a little while. You know, like cigarette smoking. Yeah. You know, for some people, mm. they can stop smoking cigarettes in two days. Mm -hmm. Others, there is a bit more of a struggle doesn't mean that ones who take a bit longer, you know, are more backward or, you know, somehow less developed or less conscious. It just means they have more to learn and it's more exciting. So the journey, yeah. if continued for, for 120 days, becomes more interesting because you begin to see much more than just, I need to stop smoking. Uh, and this meditation is something that people have practiced throughout the ages. And there is no time in the world today because, you know, I see even coming here to the studios, you know, people on traveling the underground and on the train, you know, they're so fast. There is no time to even sit. Even you are running around the planet <laughs> even I, I was. trying to wake people up. <laughs> wake up. <laughs> are you calming down? <laughs> I am. I am. That's so what you happens. do more meditation now. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, traveling, I, I still do travel. I traveled yeah. here to London. Mm -hmm. but. 
you know, I think people, the internet and TV, mm -hmm. you know, and media um, is such a wonderful yeah. tool. Yeah. And for me, that becomes an easier way to reach more people. Mm -hmm. And I think that people listen and hear and feel um, the importance of such in technology today. You know, on YouTube, there are so many wonderful videos. Um, conscious TV, you know, it, it's, it, it's much more normal, you know, yeah. it's a much more real thing. For and people. don't you think there is also an energy which is supporting that exactly. in the moment? Exactly, and on many levels, you know, yeah. I, I hear that, you know, peace, for example, you know, in the old days it was all about traveling and speaking and dialoguing with one another, but now the media can play a role that is amazing, you know, if, if conscious. Yeah, you know, yeah. not all media is, you know, aware to do that and can help change situations before they develop into conflict. And, you know, that is my deeper intention today. It's, you know, how to bring more harmony to the world, to the maximum amount of people without, you know, having to do so many things as I used to do in the past, like you say, travel every week to one yeah. place yeah. Um, and then to another place. And I believe that you know, there is an energy that is supporting that transformation. People are looking today and searching um, more actively for something that they know but quite don't quite understand. And I think the media is the way forward. Yeah. So I focus much more on the internet. Uh, I still work with people, of course, yeah. but also traveling, you know, it's difficult because, you know, I don't want to just support people for a few moments you know, one day workshop or a satsang, you know, somewhere. I want to support people in a way that is more continuous. Yeah. And, and it's impossible for me to be in all those places at the same time on this physical level. So, you know, it, it's important then to utilize technology. So this is what I'm doing. And I think many people are doing this, you mm. know, consciously. And it's a wonderful thing, like the work that you're doing. You know, you're bringing a different perspective to the world, you know, and to people watching from wherever and how to practice that in their daily lives. Yeah. And yeah. that is important for me. You know, <clears throat> people don't have to go to India or South America to find something, you know. It's they just switch the computer on. <laughs> <laughs> and open your heart. <laughs> well, a heart, you know, you, 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 you have mentioned in your book the longest journey we have to make is from our head to our heart. It is, yeah. it is. What helped you to drop into your heart? I think, um, and this sounds funny, I think suffering. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, suffering is just here to help open our heart. Yeah. I always had this belief. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the, I, I say that just because, you know, some people may be watching say, oh, it's easy for you, Tony, or it's easy for all those people mm. who have the time to meditate or mm. have the time and knowledge to practice certain techniques yeah. to, to, to get to more, a more free space. But actually, suffering, when, when embraced, you know, from a conscious perspective, and we're all conscious, you know, we just don't know. Um, when in, uh, engaged and worked with from that perspective, I feel invites you to be more human. You know, and this is what I like about people like Mother Teresa or the Dalai Lama, that they're so human, it, it shows, you yeah. know, and yeah. you don't have to call them enlightened because just what they are, mm -hmm. you know, shows that they're free, you know, and I think without suffering, you know, it's difficult to see how to be human, you know, and this is perhaps why we're here, you know, to embrace things from such a beautiful perspective, no matter what the situation is. Uh, it makes us unique, you know, conscious yeah. human beings are uh, amazingly powerful. And I, I think, you know, everyone can be conscious um, simply by embracing everything that they are, not hiding, not running away or trying to live up to some sort of perspective that is alien to who you are, but just being yourself. And that is, that is coming back to the heart, you know, like yeah. children, they are themselves. And I, I, I remember a story I was reading in one of Dalai Lama's books many years ago. In order for him to open his heart and find compassion, he went to Hiroshima to wow. be with the suffering. Wow. And that 
helped open his heart and brought him to compassion. Well, yeah. I agree. <laughs> was it your own suffering which helped you? Well, uh, it wasn't quite my own suffering. I, I grew up in Egypt and in places where suffering through poverty was much more obvious. Yeah. And I asked myself, you know, why do people have to suffer in this way? Do you know, why? I, I began to question everything really. Mm -hmm. What is the meaning of life? Why is there this pain and suffering? You know, for me, life was quite easy. You know, yeah. Because I, you know, I had everything, yeah. um, but I, I wasn't happy with just you know the yeah. selfish, selfish satisfaction of needs. I mm -hmm. wanted to understand how to make a difference to those people that were right next to me. You know, and I think that opened my perspective in a way that just remained forever as a core part of me. You know, not just to focus on me, but. How, how to make a difference in the world. Yeah. And I didn't know, you know, I was a child, um, but it's part of my personality, you know, to, to understand how to alleviate suffering. And I think yeah. like the Dalai Lama, when you see it and you, you're open to it and you understand it, then you understand that, you know, it's not enough to buy a new car or to do whatever, to feel happy. You know, there is much more to life. Mm. You mentioned we need a miracle before, <laughs> uh, which is true. And you say, the heart, is, the heart is what makes a human being a hero. And I think we need heroes. Definitely. And I, I totally agree with yeah. that. We are all heroes in the end. We just don't know it. We just don't know it. And we have to embrace that action, you know. Mm -hmm. and. It's such an amazing gift to be alive today in this world, no matter what it is mm -hmm. going through. And, you know, just by being alive, present to all that is going on, that's a heroic um, journey in itself. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Because there are lots of scary things going on. For sure, for young people, for and everyone. Yeah. yeah, and also in yourself, scary feelings exactly. and fear, and just to embrace everything as nature exactly it's a heroic exactly act. and it's possible it's but you know somebody no it's who could do it <laughs> <laughs> it's possible everyone can do it yeah. this is the thing if you put your mind to it yeah and that is through meditation through focus so that you don't get caught by the games that the mind plays mm. so another thing i want to ask you which i found really interesting is you say, breathing correctly is saying yes to life and therefore becoming free in our body. And I'm very interested in that because I'm reading a lot about the nervous system in the moment and how to bring peace into the body. Exactly. You know, I can experience stillness up here and drop into this void and you know, into, into silence. But, you know, in my daily life, I experience my body is just reacting to certain things. Yes. How, how do I find peace not only up here, but yeah. also up here? And it's not enough understanding it here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah I need to go through an experience. Yeah. The yeah. body is a mirror. You know, I see. Mm -hmm when you go to the supermarket and there is that Friday stress where everyone is rushing around, even if you're at peace, yeah. you know, you pick up yes. things. And this is why native people and people who live in more natural, um, beautiful surrounds um, say that, you know, it's madness to mm -hmm. be in, in the world today. And the body is definitely influenced by such. And just the technology and the stress of, you know, radiation and noise and pollution and whatever, you know, creates a reaction in the body, which I believe moves us away from that inner stillness or inner balance. Yeah. And that is why I focus on the body as being the temple, you know, the, the structure that maintains the possibility for stillness in the mind and in the emotions, um, how to transform that. And that is through the breath. You know, we know. Yeah, because you also say that you can see um, in the way we breathe, our, our limitations and exactly. emotions. Exactly. Yeah. Because, you know, the breath is the closest reflection to the 
the state of the physical body. You yeah. know, if you're stressed, you breathe quickly. If you're relaxed or dreaming or in a state of consciousness where you're happy, you know, your breath reflects that. Yeah. So if you're conscious and if you're able to work with the breath, to relax the breath to a state of harmony, then the body takes that as the real reference rather than the pollution or the noise or the stresses outside. And that becomes like a, a mantra, you know, that you focus on all the time whenever you feel there is disharmony in the body. So, you know, one thing that I teach, and I hope people can teach this at school and, you know, in, in hospitals and in places where, you know, people are dealing with much more physical stress than, than is normal. Mm -hmm. You know, just breathe in, take a deep breath in, the diaphragm, you know, relax the diaphragm and breathe out and take a moment just to sense what it's like to let go of the physical stress. Notice how your shoulders relax. So, so you breathe in. Deep breath, yeah, deep breath. Deep breath. Relaxing the diaphragm and then yeah. breathe, and breathe out. out. And when you breathe out, notice how your whole body just relaxes. Mm -hmm. And that state of relaxation is essential for the quality of health that the body needs to be free. You know, you, you can't say, oh yes, I'm free, and then you have your body, you know, all tight and stressed yeah. because of whatever is around. You know, you have to be um, able to reflect that in, in a more conscious way. And I, I mm -hmm. believe the breath to be essential. This is why in yoga there is pranayama, which yeah. is the science of breath. But uh, there is no need to go so deeply into breathing. It's a simple matter of letting go of stresses. When you do that, I think your body relaxes and comes back to a, a state which is much more joyous. You know, it, it's much more easy to feel happiness when you're relaxed than when you're stressed. And I think this is something that anyone can do. I know, but wherever. I, you know, I forget. <laughs> I, f I forget the breathing because yeah. it's something so like I forget that my heart is pumping. <laughs> it's something so, so normal. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, of course, you, it's, a, it's another habit, the way we breathe. And to change this habit, do we have to go through a period of... No, no, the, to change that habit, yeah. the, the problem is that in the West we are so much in the mind. Mm -hmm. That is where the energy is. We have to bring it back down to the body. So the breathing yeah. is a reminder for the body to, to, to be part of what's going on. You know, to be alive. To be alive, you know, and this is why native people, you know, when they see Western people walking, yeah. they say, my gosh, you know, where are they? <laughs> Which planet are they on? Because they're not here on Earth. Because, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, the way they're walking is not grounded. And, yeah. You know, when you breathe in that deep, relaxed way, you know, you realize, I have a body. I can interact with my body in a way that is not just reflecting the stress, I can show the world that I'm happy. You know, like your partner, you know, if, you're, if your body is relaxed, you can embrace them with that joy and relaxed body. And they feel it and you feel the connection to the physical realm because we are manifested here on this physical realm. We have to ground ourselves here. Mm -hmm. And I feel the breath is the first step to, to remember the body. And I think when you remember the body several times, oh yeah, I've got my hands, oh yeah, I've got my feet, and I'm walking on the ground, you know, it becomes more an automatic response to how you experience the world. You, you slowly ground yourself in a way that is not normal in the West. This is why in Zen Buddhism, part of the meditations are called walking meditations, yeah. where you listen to a rhythm that can be the rhythm of the mantra that you're chanting or an external rhythm, yeah. and you walk in a way where consciousness is manifested through your action, yeah. you know, your physical action, the way you touch the earth, the way you show your body to the world. Mm -hmm. And I think this is very important. This is, mm -hmm. you know, a matter of practice. And the more yeah. practice, the easier it gets. So, Tony, do you have your own practice? You do on a daily basis or? Of course. <laughs> I, I think everyone has their own practice. Um, so I never say, you know, this is the way. You know, yeah. you, you have to do this um, and you have to do it like this. Everyone is unique. Every human being has a personality, has a perspective, has such a wonderful way of learning. There is, 
you shouldn't push it aside and then say, no, this is not right and this is the right way to mm. do things. But for me, meditation, which is in a much wider perspective, just relating to the harmony of life rather than the distractions of the mind, can be put into practice, into real practice. So perhaps saying to yourself, every three hours I'll take two minutes just to breathe and to look at the world from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to remind, as you said in the beginning, you know, you have, if you forget, you have to have reminders. And the yeah. reminder can be you just saying to yourself, I need discipline, so this means I need to remind myself in the morning and the evening to sit in meditation. Mm -hmm. But then that sitting becomes the meditation that carries on in, you know, your daily experience and even in your sleep. You know, if you meditate for 20 minutes before falling asleep, you know, the mantra that you repeat or the focus on some beautiful aspect such as poetry or a beautiful quality of the heart is carried deeper into your sleep. And also in the morning if you wake up and you meditate, then you start the day with a different perspective, which, you know, goes beyond just the 20 minutes of meditation that you have yeah. as your practice. Yeah. So, you know, this is what I like to do. I like to bring spirituality into life. The way you relate to people, the way you say hello to someone that you don't know, you know, mm -hmm. your acts of kindness to everyone, um, your, just your relationship to everything becomes a spiritual work. So if you're a Christian, if you're Muslim, if you're Buddhist, you can continue your practice. But you know, the quality, the heart, needs to be very much the most important aspect of that pra yes. practice. And for me, you know, I find it very useful to repeat beautiful mantras, sacred sounds. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a Hindu, you can practice, for example, the sound of Om. Um, I, usually say to people, why not try who, which is H-U. Um, it's Sufi, a Sufi sound. Uh, it's a Sufi sound, yeah. a Middle Eastern sound. Mm -hmm. um, but it can be anything. It could be light, which in Aramaic is Noor. You know, um, noor? And noor, you know, mm -hmm. and you can say, you know, light, 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 so that every situation that the mind think, thinks of that is worrying or limiting or dark or negative, mm -hmm. you know, has another force that you can reference to, which is light, or Om, um, which is the creation of life, or if you're Christian, you can, you know, chant something from um, the Christian tradition. If you're Muslim, you can chant something from the Muslim tradition. It's up to each person. In the end, it is like Kabir says, you know, there are many ways, but in, you know, there is only one real way, and that is the way of the heart. And yes. I think if you are truly real and you are, you know, coming back to your heart, then it doesn't matter what the practice is, you know, it's your action that counts. Yeah. It's beautiful. I'm just looking at the clock. <laughs> 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 I think we have to finish. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to talk with you about children and we might do another interview on I that if you, if uh, you I'm are happy. okay yeah, with I'm happy that, to do because that. it's such a big subject. And it is. Um, a worrying one. <laughs> it is, yeah, <clears throat> it is. But also delightful. Yes. And, um, <clears throat> well, it was lovely to talk to you, Tony, and you. <clears throat> to have you back in your busy schedule, and I show you books again. Thank you. Um, so, Deeper Than Words, and those books, in those books you find Tony's teaching from now, the way yes. you teach now, yes. and from the heart. And if you would like to know more about his journey to become a shaman, this is a fascinating one, Shaman's Wisdom. Okay, well, thank you for watching Conscious TV and um, thank you, Tony, thank for you. being with us and I will see you again soon. Goodbye.
Hello, my name is Tony Samara and I'd like to show you a very practical breathing meditation that I find very essential in today's busy, busy world. Take a moment to just sit down, relax your body, relax your shoulders, make sure that you're completely free of whatever worries or thinkings that occupy the mind and come back to the breath. Take a deep breath. Experiment with breathing in deeply into your belly, relaxing the diaphragm. More breath, more breath, and then relax. And as you let go of the breath, feel how the mind and all the energy of your body moves to a deeper state of consciousness. As you breathe out, let go of everything. Feel how the face and the neck and the shoulders and the body just sink into a more beautiful, more tranquil space. Now that your body is relaxed, you can breathe even more. Take another deep breath. A happy joyous breath where everything feels much more beautiful, much more harmonious, much more clear. And as you breathe out, notice how your mind and the energy of your body with your out breath goes deeper and deeper to a space where you gently discover a sense of tranquility, a sense of stillness, a sense of peace, and embrace that from a perspective of joy, a perspective of yes, this is now part of who I am, this sense of relaxation, this sense of beauty, this sense of harmony is now manifested in my body and continue to breathe in and out in this beautiful way as long as you feel comfortable. And perhaps carrying on that intention throughout the day and every time you find yourself lost in the stresses and the actions of um, the mundaneness coming back to that tranquility. Slowly, when you're ready, coming back. Thank you.